Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Purpose Tune podcast. The goal of the show is to create valuable content to hopefully broaden your knowledge, inspire you to act, and get you in the right mindset so you can apply it in your own life to drive impact, generate meaning, and achieve your purpose. Now, today's guest is Dai Manuel, and Dai is a super dad. He's dating his wife, and he's leading by example as a way to um, fully inspire us to live um, with our personality, uh, and he's on a mission to positively impact 1 million role models around the globe to lead a functionality uh, fit life through education, encouragement, and community. He is also an award-winning digital thought leader and author, uh, distinguished Toastmaster and keynote speaker, um, and a former partner and chief operating officer of a multi-million dollar retail company uh, and a salt after lifestyle mentor and executive performance coach. So um, Dai, Dade, uh, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. I appreciate your time. Uh, let's check in. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Ong. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be here and uh, reconnecting with you. I know we had a quick meet and greet about a week and a half ago. So it's, it's nice to connect again to my fellow West Coaster, even though you're, you're much further south than I am. Uh, I, me being in Vancouver, you being in San Diego, it's, uh, I, I would trade spots with you. So uh, <laughs> you, you just say when. But uh, yeah, no, it's doing really well. It's a, it's a Friday and uh, hopefully the sun's going to come out in a bit and, you know, it's only going to get better from there. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a great outlook in life. I mean, that's uh, that's how you do it. Uh, so, so tell us more about your background, um, other than what I've mentioned. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for the intro and thanks for having me here. You know, I always appreciate the opportunity to connect with not, not only cool people but new audiences. And uh, you know, a big part of why I do what I do is, uh, you know, I, I've had a lot of struggles in life. I mean, we all do, right? Like, we all have our challenges. We all encounter them. I mean, you go back as far as we've had the, the, the ability to tell stories. I mean, we like a good story. We like a good challenge, but we also <laughs> like to see people overcome challenges, don't we? Like right. we do. We like to see like the Rudies of the world, right? The, the underdogs being triumphant and because we all see ourselves in everybody else's stories at times. And, and you know, when I was a teenager, uh, I, because for people that are just first being introduced to, to me and some of my background, like I've been in the wellness industry now, holy smokes, 26 years, my entire adult life, I've worked in the wellness space. So in fitness, nutrition, mindset, I still do. I love it. Uh, but I didn't come to it naturally. You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people that work in the wellness space, they've come to it because there's probably a really strong passion to it. Like a lot of people that are in the health and the wellness space, there's a lot of former athletes or people that have had a fitness lifestyle like their entire life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just this chasing of that continuation of that passion and now supporting others with it. And then there's the other school, which is people that have had massive transformations that have now found themselves trying to support others with similar transformations. I'm from that end of the spectrum. Uh, I was morbidly obese as a teenager and oh, really? uh, for people, yeah. It, it, and it, you know, it, for people that don't understand what that means, uh, I think we all have a general idea. Oh, morbid obesity doesn't sound good. Uh, it, I was very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, from a, for a period of about five years from about age nine to 14, almost 15, mm -hmm. I, I had a lifestyle that was conducive of that state of unhealth, meaning that you know, it wasn't rocket science. Uh, like you didn't need rocket science uh, or to be a rocket scientist, I should say, to figure out, okay, how did you get like this? It, I played a lot of video games, watched a lot of movies. So I was on my butt a lot, didn't move much. And then on top of that, I had a lot of food. And, and you know, and when I say a lot of food, it was actually a lot of very nutrition poor food, but very high calorie. And, you know, so a lot of refined sugars, a lot of real carby, uh, starchy foods mm. uh, that we call the, the feel good foods. Right. <laughs> and because at an early age, I learned how to deal with a lot of my my stress, my anxiety and, and a lot of those inner uh, negative thought patterns. And I would cope and numb very often escape from those feelings through through food and video games, you know, mm. so and, and you know, this isn't new. Right. This the story that I'm telling. Sure, it's my story. But I know we all have a shade of that same story. 
you know, it may not be exact, but we've all had similar experiences, especially when it comes to healthy living, you know? Uh, and so it took about 20 months. I went through a big change. You know, I, I battled with depression, anxiety. Uh, I, I had suicidal thoughts, which is, mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to downplay that, but it, it, it was a common thought in my mind, man, it sure would be easier. Life is hard right now. Wouldn't right. it be easier just to not have to do it? And mm -hmm. it was never something that I took action on. Uh, and to be honest, I was really afraid of that. Plus, I, I knew I had a lot of family and, and people that loved me. I did. I, I didn't. It's not like I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel cared for, you know, like right. I didn't care for myself. I didn't love myself. That was the big issue. And and so I made some changes. You know, I got to what I believe was my rock bottom emotionally and psychologically, but it took me getting there to realize, okay, if I don't make some changes right now, I can see my future and the very short distance, things aren't going to get better. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're probably only going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And so here I am faced with either I can change, do something I'm completely scared of and don't know how to do it. Don't even know where to begin. Or there's this alternative option of just continuing to, to live life as I am with the hope that maybe it gets better, but really truthfully knowing that it won't. <laughs> that idea scared me way more than the idea of, ah, why don't I just figure out how to change my life? You know, why don't I figure out how to get healthy, how to eat differently? It was scary too. Like it changes scary. It just is, right? For all of us, change is intimidating. Changing right. a job, changing a career, changing a town that you live in, changing a relationship. Like it's all intimidating. You know, change happens. It happens fast. And a lot of times we feel like a victim of change, not as a, a champion of change, right? <laughs> and uh, I certainly had more of the victim mindset for a, a big chunk of my life. And uh, so I embraced this idea of change and I was intimidated, scared, sure. But I realized that I wanted to change and I wasn't going to accept how I was anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I, I educated myself. I went to the library. I got books out on nutrition. Mm -hmm. on, on fitness my kids laugh right like because my kids are, are soon to be 16 and 18 and and, and they're like well why don't you just google it dad and i'm like <laughs> you, your dad's older than google <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> which is always uh, unfortunate to, to to acknowledge but uh <laughs> you know re regardless uh you know i started to educate myself and then from that education i gained confidence and clarity and i was able to take some actions and for me it was just mountain biking because it was something i could do privately didn't have to be around other people, didn't have to rely on anybody else, didn't have to deal with any intimidation or fear factor of going into a gym mm -hmm. or working with a trainer or a nutritionist, because that was offered to me by my parents, but I was intimidated by that. You know, I was scared of that. It, it was just, again, another barrier creating what I believed was going to prevent me from achieving any change. And, and so I just took it upon myself to start doing that stuff, you know, and in a short period of time, I remember experiencing, and, and for those that are listening to this, and then I'll just sort of and this story or this side note, yeah, but it's important to understand this origin story, just like, you know, like I always love the Marvel movies, right? Where we get those background stories to explain how did they get to where they are now? I and mean, we love a good story, don't we? But this story is what ultimately planted the seed for everything that I did following the change. You know, everything in my life has been tied to that story. Mm -hmm. That's where my motivation was originally inspired. And, um, so, you know, I started making these changes and started exercising, started eating differently. And about three weeks in, because I remember the very first time I went out for my mountain bike ride, and I, and I think people will relate to this. And, you know, it, it's like you already know you're, you're not in great shape. You already know you're fairly deconditioned. You know that things are challenging. <laughs> you know, maybe you're, you can relate to this, but I remember going up a flight of stairs and I could feel sweat starting to form on my body. You know, like I'd be out of breath, like a flight, mm -hmm. one flight. Mm -hmm. you know, bending over to tie my shoes. Whoo, that was an ordeal, you know, mm -hmm. and like just some of the most basic things that we just don't ever think about. We just do like, for me, it, it wasn't just a do situation. It was like mentally preparing myself. Oh my gosh, I got to go do this. It's so hard. Right. And that's just how life felt. So it felt like I had this massive weight on my shoulders on top of the weight around my stomach, you know? And, right. and so things just felt challenging all the time. And so here I am starting to mountain bike, this morbidly obese teenager, right, on this mountain bike, which my dad, I, I still appreciate it to this very day that he saw that look in my eye when I came out and I said, I'm, I want to make a change, dad, I want to do this. He knew that I was serious. And 
And so he was like, well, what can we do to help? What can we do to support? I was like, I want a bike. And that weekend we went and bought me a bike. You know, like that's how quick I got the support from my family that, because they wanted, they saw in me that I was ready. I was wanting to change for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so here I am riding my bike. I go out, we live out in the rural part of Ontario. So just outside of Toronto, sort of a, a, a smaller community, lots of rural land, you know, old farms and stuff. And uh, I, I, I'm going down Concession Street and there's this mountain. Okay. And I joke, like I live in the West coast, man. I live off the Rockies, right? Like Vancouver, anyone that's been here, you know what I'm talking about. These like, those are mountains. <laughs> now me as that, you know, 14, 15 year old morbidly obese teenager, this hill looked like Everest. <laughs> you know, like It was so intimidating. And I remember I'm cycling up to it and I'm like, oh man, oh man, I don't know. I can't do this. I can't do this. You know, like it's like the opposite of the little train that could, right? <laughs> it's yeah. not like, I think I can't. I think, no, it's like, there's no way I can. There's no way I can. Anyways, I, 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 I make it up a third of the way up that hill you know, AKA Everest. And so I'm not even making it to first base camp. And I get to a point, the bike just stops. And I'm looking up at the top there and I'm like, oh man, I'm so far off of making it. And then just plump, you know, fell off. And uh, I couldn't, and you know, trying to get back on the bike to try to get started. I just couldn't, I could not get the bike to move. But in me, it was this thought like, okay, well, I can't do this. I've already failed. Hmm. And there was this desire to just turn around, <laughs> ride down at least that third of the hill uh, and coast back home. Then I thought like, no, that's just me giving up before I even started. And so I walked the bike to the top and then I continued on my way. Mm -hmm. Interesting to note is I came back and I went after that hill again the next day and then the next day and then the next day. After about three and a half weeks and it was just it wasn't planned for, but all of a sudden, I made it. I ascended it without getting off the bike, without stopping. Three wow. and a half weeks in. Like, I will tell you right now that the day that I made it to the top of the hill was the day where I truly believed that I can change anything I ever want to change. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, when we have such a profound experience where we achieve a win and we know that we <laughs> did something to create that, to make it happen. It is so empowering because all of a sudden you start to believe that change is possible and you are not, we're no longer just a victim of change. It just happens to us. Like the world happens to us. It, we actually feel like we can contribute. We can have some influence on what happens mm -hmm. either directly or sometimes indirectly, right? Based on some of our actions. But uh, so that was it. That was sort of that turning point. You being in the States, an ESPN turning point. In Canada, we call it TSN turning points. <laughs> you know, it's where the, the underdogs, all of a sudden, whoo, they make score a point or reverse a play. Next thing you know, they win. But it's that turning point in the game where it's like, whoa, everything changed, right? For me, that was my turning point. Right. And then ever since then, you know, I, I, it took me 20 months to release the weight and to develop a lifestyle that became a lifestyle. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to think about it anymore. I just, I eat a certain way. I'd move my body a certain way. I would think a certain way. Like just, it became automatic. It became part of my subconscious. Right. And I got so excited with helping others do the same thing. Cause people like my friends and my parents would come by the house, not to hang out or see my parents. They were like, Oh yeah, is die here. I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, he's just out back, you know, and playing basketball or whatever. And so they come back and they'd be like, hey, do you got a few minutes? And they would start asking me questions about fitness, about nutrition, how to train. And here I am, a 17 year old kid. And I'm like, you came over here to ask me about this stuff? Like, <laughs> are you sure? Why? You know, like, because I've never had that in my life ever. And it made me feel really good to be able to help people, you know? And, and it was that it was the bug, you know, I got bit and, uh, that's where I really started to lean into coaching and mentorship and supporting others with changing and, and creating the change that they want, you know, and I often just help people get out of the way. I just help them get out of the way. So they achieve the results faster than they could achieve them if they were on their own, mm. you know, and uh, that's what I've been doing the last 26 years. So that's sort of the origin. That's the backstory. That's like the little piece that's sort of in between the lines of the intro you gave, <laughs> you know, but, but that just gives an idea of, of sort of the motivation, the inspiration of why I, I just continue to do what I do every day, you know? So, so thank you so much for sharing your story. It's such yeah, a powerful no story. And I think that a lot of people, especially guys, we need to be more vulnerable in terms of um, mm. 
how we perceive um, um, losing weight. I know there's a lot of guys out there that, um, you know, at one point um, in their lives were obese and they're scared to share that. And I think that we need to build a community consist of men who can, um, you know, bring out um, the, I don't want to use the word uh, emotions, but um, the, the experiences um, that really led them to um, a negative route of depression and anxiety. And mm. when we have more voices that can tap into that space, we can then inspire more people to say, hey, you know, I can relate to you because I at one point uh, was obese. And, you know, what was your journey like? What was your process? What was the mindset tool set that you used to get out of that, <clears throat> that, that, that box that you put yourself in? And so um, I want to thank you for sharing that story because mm. it's such a powerful story. You're um, <clears throat> what was that aha moment for you um, that, 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 that sort of changed the tra tra trajectory of your, your life? Um, I think you mentioned about like being on top of that Mount Everest, um, but <clears throat> was it more to it than that or? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, listen, I was still, uh, you know, I'm barely into puberty at the time, right? Like I had late puberty because of my inactivity and that state of unhealth, like I, I had retarded puberty. And so all of a sudden when I started adapting at my lifestyle to be more conducive with health and, and well-being, uh, it kickstarted puberty, which also helped, you know, like all of a sudden that, that rush of testosterone definitely helped me from a metabolic standpoint, you know, th there's some good hormones that kick in and all of a sudden that, that helped me with, with releasing some of that weight. That's why, you know, hormone health is a very important conversation. And especially for a lot of men today, and I see this a lot, especially with some of the clients I work with, you know, very, very low testosterone levels, you know, and, and there's lots of mitigating factors that might be a cause to that. I'm not going to get into details right now. That's probably a whole nother conversation. Uh, but, but I do encourage men, especially as they get to 35 and beyond, uh, you know, having your hormones checked every couple of years is a really good idea. You know, just go get a hormone profile, uh, maybe see a functional medicine practitioner or a naturopath. They're pretty good at getting those profiles done and giving you some of the deeper data versus because a lot of medical doctors like I, I find they're just really apprehensive doing any of these sort of they call them like super superfluous tests right like tests that might not be needed and I'm like well they they are needed and uh, that's why I always say you know make sure you're working with somebody that is a little not so by the book uh, you know, find people that are maybe more into that sort of the biohacking space. I'm not saying that that's the end all be all, but right. I, I always like to look at people that complement both the Eastern and the Western philosophies, of, especially as it comes to well being. And because I, we just don't know what we don't know. So we should be open to trying to learn as much as we can. And now, that was sort of just a mindset and a decision I made a long time ago that I know I don't know everything, mm -hmm. but I know I'm capable of meeting people and getting around people that can either role model me or teach me either through the works that they've created, the content they've put out. And so I became just a, a forever learner. Right. You know, and, and I realized that during that early stage, you know, getting those books from the library. Cause when you think about change, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's three questions. So anybody that's listening to this, just put these three questions to memory. Like if there's something right now in your life, either personally or professionally, that you'd like to see changed, these are three questions I'd like to ask yourself. You know, first question: Can I do this? <laughs> you know, like just as an example, me as that that morbidly obese teen. It's like, okay, I want to get healthy. I want to change my. Life. I don't want to be this fat anymore. You know, and to be honest, like I wanted a girlfriend. That was my extrinsic motivation. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. I just wanted someone else to want me, right? Right. A female companion. Whoa, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. You know, so that was, you know, as that prepubescent teen, trust me, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> so, so there's always a carrot. It's the carrot, the right? Uh, what? What? I'm sure you're not the only guy at the gym. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, and I'm just being honest, like uh, that was obviously one of the motivations, you know, it, it, beyond just what I wanted for myself, you know, was also this idea of, of just wanting to be wanted, to be included, to feel like I'm part of a group or a community versus I was always isolating myself. You know, it wasn't them saying, Hey, you can't hang out with us. It was me choosing not to hang out with because I wasn't comfortable. I felt really low about myself, low self-opinion, like just, 
anyway, so that, that, moving along, you know, that this idea, can I do this? So me as myself, can I lose this weight? And when you ask yourself a question, so whatever the change is, is like, can I do this? Can I achieve this thing that I want, which is going to involve changing? When we ask that question, you know, the brain <laughs> starts to secrete serotonin. Right. And, and because whenever we hear questions, this is just what happens. The brain's got to relax itself a little bit. And serotonin has got this nice relaxing effect because what happens is when we relax ourselves, it's actually when the, and you've probably heard this term, the creative juices, right? We start to be able to create more. We start to think more freely. We were able to connect ideas in creative ways. Mm -hmm. And so by asking the right questions, we start to, and even if it's a rhetorical question, like we still, we, we perk up a bit. We, we start to think, you know, you hear somebody ask a question, whether you were asked it directly or not, you <laughs> automatically start thinking it, don't you? You start thinking about a possible, it's just, it's just our biology. Okay. <laughs> so we're talking about using biology to benefit us and to help us along. And so asking the right questions is key. So this question, can I do this? You start to increase a little serotonin and why, what is the prize? What do we want to find the answer for? Because we get a dopamine hit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Dopamine's good. You know, next to adrenaline is probably the, the, the second most powerful chemical that we have in our body. And yeah. it helps us do a lot of stuff. It's a big motivating factor, right? Whether we are watching Netflix and we get a dopamine hit by watching a show and having a laugh or we're reading a good book or we're having a great workout. You know, there's lots of ways to, to generate some of those feel good um, uh, um, uh, neurological like stimulus, right? And so here you are, you ask yourself, can I do this? To find the answer for that, it usually involves education. So it could be working with a coach, finding a role model, finding a good book, a wonderful podcast like this one, right? <laughs> and and you, you start to seek the answers, the proof, if you will, or the backup to support your belief that you can do this. Mm. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times when you start looking for the education is because you want clarity and confidence, mm. right? Like, think about it. When you're, you, you don't know something or you feel foggy on something, it's really hard to commit. We're kind of sheepish about committing. Think about the last time you had a, a, you were hired for a new position in a new company, right? Learning new tasks or responsibilities. There's a lot of intimidation there, mm -hmm. right? We're worried we're going to make a mistake. I'm going to screw something up. And so if we don't have a really good onboarding process, right? In a new hire, it's really intimidating. And it's really hard to be super productive because you're always going to be going back to that next person up the food chain and asking, oh, did I do this right? Or do I do it like this? How do you do this? And, and it limits us from taking action. Hmm. So the goal of that first question, get clarity, also get some confidence that, oh, I can learn what I need to do to actually achieve some of these changes. Now, that's not all of it. Just understanding, oh, I, I cause I knew if I eat differently and I work out, good. In theory, I'll be healthier. I actually got to go do something though. <laughs> you know, like it, it's one thing to be theoretical about it and put and think about it in your mind, but you actually involves going and doing something. Mm -hmm. So that first question, can I do this? Get some clarity on that. Get some basic understanding and awareness of, of what are some next steps that will help you with creating the change. Then you ask the second question. If I do this, <laughs> will it work? Right. If I do this, will it work? Because, you know, for me as that kid, it's like, yeah, okay, I figured it out. I went to the book library. I got some books. I now understand. I understand how to exercise a bit more. I know what happens when I eat certain foods. Oh, insulin. Interesting. I didn't know that's how it works. No wonder all those sugars I was eating was making me fatter. Oh, okay. I got it. So all of a sudden I'm getting clarity and confidence. Mm -hmm. And I'm like that second question, you know, okay, well, if I now start to exercise and I start to eat differently, Will I actually see some results? Will I see some changes? And this is where, you know, there's a little bit of trust in ourselves to just go start doing it. And hope keeps us going is hoping that we see some results. And if you don't see some results fairly quickly, some wins, it's really hard to stay motivated to keep going. Right. And, and so for me, because it took me a little while to get those wins. Like, like I said, three and a half weeks in, I finally had the big win, you know, make it to the top of that mountain <laughs> or at least that little hill. It's still, it's funny. I've gone back to visit and I've taken my kids on a drive there <laughs> and it oh, takes me like two minutes to drive up the hill. And I'm like, and not even two minutes, sorry. It's like 20 seconds to drive up it. And I'm like, man, when I was a teen, this took forever to get up, <laughs> you know? So it's funny how perspective just shifts. Right. And uh, so that second question, you know, for me, because I didn't have a lot of 
trust or hope because I'd never done it before. Fortunately for me, I was able to find examples of other people that have had similar changes or transformations. Mm. So this is where it's awesome because I mean, today with the internet, I mean, if you have a certain change that you're looking to make in your life, chances are there's somebody out there that's done something very similar. Right. That builds belief in us. It's like, well, if they can do it, why can't I do it? You know, so again, it's another way of, of gaining some confidence, right? While you're also getting clear. So number one, can I do this? Number two, if I do this, will it work? Mm -hmm. Then you have to follow it up. So now you've got a yes and a yes, right? You've started to move things. The, the needle's moving in the right direction. You're, you're starting to gain clarity and confidence. Now there's number three. If I, yeah, is it worth it, right? It's a value question. Mm -hmm. and, and it's great. Like when I work with teams or organizations, whatever, nonprofits, like I'll, I'll, I'll pose these three questions and it's like, is it worth it? Is the change worth it? Mm -hmm. But when I'm working with individuals, the question to ask actually is just to look in the mirror and say, am I worth it? Oh, wow. That's powerful. that, that <laughs> not so easy to answer, is it? It's, it's a pretty challenging question for a lot of us. Cause I'll tell you as a teenager, I didn't believe that I didn't, you know, when I was my unhealthiest and I remember looking in the mirror and I hated that person looking back at me. I didn't think there was any value in that person. And so that third one, it's, it's not easy, you know, and, and that's why it's often best to, to find a community. You know, if we can't honestly say that to ourselves, yeah, I'm worth this. I'm worth the change. Chances are anybody that loves you, anybody that's close to you, if you were to ask them, hey, do you think it, I'm worth this change? And you explained what you wanted and what you want to see changes and what you were feeling challenged by in your life. They're going to be like, hell yeah, you're worth it. Come yeah. on. Like, can I help you? What can I do to support you? You know, like that's, so it's, it's, it's recognized if we can't get to that answer ourselves immediately, we'll surround ourselves with people that can uplift us, put us in the right direction, but also maybe hold us a little bit accountable. Right. And, yeah. and, and so that, that third question, am I worth it? It's not the easy one to answer, but it is one to, to work on because mm -hmm. once you've got those three yeses and, and you're now in motion, starting to put action in place for the pieces that you've said you want to change, it happens. It may take time, but it happens. It's just a matter of embracing a process. Right. And, and so those are the three questions. I'm just going to throw it out there. Those are the three you want to put to memory. Anytime you want to go through change, just think about one thing you want to change right now, use those filters, you know, those three questions as filters, and uh, hopefully it'll help you with the clarity and the confidence. But remember, you always got to follow it up with action. Right. If you don't do any action, uh, probably not going to have anything happen. I'm just sorry, sorry to say, it's just <laughs> the way it is. Like, uh, <laughs> I'd still be that morbidly obese uh, <laughs> individual had I not put it into action some of the things that I was getting clear and, and confident around, you know? That's amazing. So I, what I'm hearing from you is that uh, coaching people is when it comes to losing weight or achieving their fitness goals is more than just nutrition and, and lifestyle. It's about the mindset. It's about um, getting people to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what have, what has been some of the the aha moments for you when you're coaching your clients um, and you're like, well, like this is more than just fitness. Like we're talking about getting people to believe in themselves. How do we get there? And you're not just a fitness coach. You're now, you know, you have to be a life coach for them because mm. it's more than just losing weight. Yeah. And so in, you know, when we help people in this journey, in their fitness journey, we have to assess them from a holistic uh, viewpoint. So what's your take on that? Well, I agree with you. And uh, I, you know, after being in the industry now for 26 years or in my 26 year, uh, <laughs> I can honestly say that I've so we're young, by the way, so. I, well, thank you. I, <laughs> but I can honestly say I, I've seen it all, you know, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I have a very, well, let's just put love-hate relationship, okay? I'll just call it what it is. A love-hate relationship with the fitness industry. I love it because what it can create for people. But I also dislike it a lot for the way it goes about marketing. And because mm -hmm. the, the issue at hand is it, it is very surface, right? Like, and what I mean by that 
And I'm not trying to put it all in one bucket. There's amazing people doing amazing things out there that are going against the grain, but they are ones that are embracing more of a lifestyle and life coach approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that does more than just address the symptoms, something that goes deeper. Because me being ob obese was really just a symptom mm -hmm. of a much deeper issue that I was working through. And it had a lot to do with self-worth, mm -hmm. you know, self-confidence self-image self-opinion like self-limiting beliefs like you know so the self i'm, I'm saying a lot here because it, it all just turned back on me it was like a lot of the things i need to work through i had to work through them of course i found support um but you know just working out wasn't going to be the fix because it, we, we see this a lot right like i mean a lot of people i don't know the exact stat right now but it, it, it would baffle you when you look at how many people have Try to diet, gotten results, yet find themselves gaining it back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at shows like The Biggest Loser, right? Like, the data is out there. I, I've, I've published, republished some of the, the the stats that came back from. But when they did a, a survey of all the past contestants, mm -hmm. I think it's like less than two percent ever maintained something semblance healthy life after the fact. You know, like it's like ridiculous number, like just shocking. But that is a direct reflection. Of the world you know and so we have, we have to wonder well why what what's the issue here and and so it comes on down to like how do we support people what are we actually helping them with like it's why you know well over a decade ago i stopped focusing on teaching people how to do a better squat mm -hmm. like, that's not the issue here like a squat's a squat's a squat and i know there's fitness guys out there that will be like no it's not you know you got to have your feet this way and i'm like okay well semantics I'm more interested in just getting people moving yeah. because when we, as Tony Robbins says, you know, he's like, what is it? Motion creates emotion. Mm -hmm. Right. And we know that when we move our body, positive endorphins are released, especially when we're moving our body in a positive way, like trying to elicit an increased heart rate through some, you know, cardiovascular activity, go for a nice walk out in the forest right. or in your local park, heck up and down your flight of stairs it, it feel good feelings start to happen because your body actually is telling you, dude, this feels good. Thank you. You know, like the body, if it could talk to us, would tell us that. It'd be like, high five, man. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, good. Uh, <laughs> but, but here's the issue the fitness industry likes to quantify everything. How much weight can you move on the bench? Right. What's your waist size? How much do you weigh on the scale? How fast is your one mile run? What's your vertical leap? You know, like we are so comfortable. With putting a number on it engaging people's success based on the numbers changing mm -hmm. where i am way more interested in the person that says yeah i want to lose 30 pounds and i'm like okay but why like, why do you want to lose 30 pounds like really like what's the reason that you want to release this weight and never have it come back to you again like right. what's going on how does it make you feel you know when was the last time you remember you know, do you remember what life was like before you had this extra 30 pounds? What were you doing? What was life like? You know, and what were the quality of relationships like? When you looked in the mirror, what did you think? How did you feel? Because hmm. those are the things that, you know, are really important to address is the psyche, right? Our emotional state, our psychological state, and that connection to our physicality. Right. And, and recognizing that our actions, the things that we do often, especially like our habits, they influence that mental state mm -hmm. drastically. I mean, we look at the year that we've just had of COVID mental health stats out the yin yang. Why? Well, because we've been in isolation, <laughs> disconnected, and yet thinking that we're more connected than ever because of these technology tools. Well, it's there's going to be a lot of data coming out like it already is. It's, it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, like we're ready. We need people to be with people again. <laughs> and uh, so just to close off this section, you know, when it comes to the motivation, you know, for, for change, I, I really like to encourage people, get clear on what the result will be for you emotionally and psychologically by attaining that physical goal that you may have. Mm. You know, like for me, I, I remember one lady I was, I was working with for, for quite a while, you know, she wanted to lose 60 pounds. And when I started to dig into it, she's like, well, cause I'll feel better. I'll fit into all my old clothes. Like there's a lot of things, but I knew that 
we were just scratching the surface, mm. you know, it, and, and so I had to prod a little bit more and ask a few more questions, you know, and, and when I started asking her questions about intimacy and her relationships, mm -hmm. she found that she would always hold back from those. Like she hadn't been intimate with her husband for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, a long time because she didn't feel confident in herself. She felt a lot of shame, mm -hmm. a lot of guilt around her physicality. And, and so that affected the dynamics in the relationship, you know, and, and, she wanted to regain some of that inner self-confidence, some of that love for herself, because as it's, you know, we hear the, the quote often, right? If you can't love yourself, well, who can you love, right? right. Exactly. Well, it's true, man. It sounds like a cliche, but it's true. If you, if you don't care and think positively of yourself, it's really hard to, to think positively about others. Mm -hmm. And so when it really, when we got down to the, the root of it and, and it came down to really just her wanting to be confident again in herself, to love looking at herself in the mirror, to not shy away from, from the camera whenever it comes out or a smartphone comes out, right? Yeah. To be able to start having those authentic conversations with people again and feeling connected. Mm -hmm. That was the piece that wanted. And it just happened to be that it creating a regular fitness routine, mm -hmm. changing some nutrition habits, adding in some meditation, a little bit of journaling, you know, daily walks, like just basic stuff. Like, and you'll notice all the stuff I just said, it's all free. It doesn't cost any money. <laughs> like, this is the best part. And people are like, well, then why would I hire you? I'm like, don't hire me. I don't care. <laughs> I just want you to be happy, man. You know, like just start doing some of the things that you probably already know you ought to be doing more of. Right. I think and, more accountability in you. Yeah. yeah. And that, and I mean, that can help, right? I, I just help people get to the result quicker than they could do it on their own. That's, I mean, that's bottom line, you know, and, and I can often point out, uh, think about me. I'm, I'm kind of like a, uh, you know, the GPS is kind of funny, right? You type into Google, you got a destination and it'll tell you, Oh man, the traffic's really thick over there. You know, maybe take a different route. Right. Yeah. And, and, it's great. I, I equate that sort of how I work with people as a mentor, right? It's like, oh, okay, I know you want to do that, but I've been down that path before. And trust me, let's go this direction because I think it's going to work way better for you. And you won't potentially deal with these repercussions, you know, and I'll point out some of the things that may pop up if they want to go the other direction. And, and so that's all I do. I, I help guide people to a result that they said is important, you know? Uh, so yeah, anyways, sorry, I, I get off on a tangent there, but that that was sort of the gist of, of my conversation on the fitness industry. And, and But what I feel really optimistic about is there's lots of changes in this conversation that you and I are having right now. It's happening all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like the holistic approach to well-being, it's more than just going to the gym. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the general awareness and consciousness is now in that place where it's recognizing that. Right. And so the conversations people are having, they recognize mental health yeah. is a thing. It is a thing. Um, <laughs> like, uh, well, and it's great, right? You know what? So I was just working out with a buddy uh, last weekend and there's this guy that I've been seeing at the gym. You know, he goes to this, he's, he and I are on the same schedule. Um, yeah. And, and I, I've, you know, been to this gym for a couple of months now and I've observed him and he seems to socialize more often than he does work out. And yeah. So I made a comment to my buddy. I was like, well, you know, this guy seems like he's not working out. He's just socializing, you know, and that's just defer defeats the purpose of the gym. And my buddy was like, you know, there are different ways that people cope about men mental health. And I'm like, and he, he gave me this like eye-opening yeah. perspective. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so true. Like the gym is not just a place to work out. It's a place to be connected with other people, like-minded yes. people, to build community, build relationships. And, and that helps with mental health. And so, yes. and, and that was, it, you know, I, I, I now have more, more empathy for, for mm. the um, and it's like you're saying, mental health is such a huge issue and America hasn't really done a great job at solving the mental health crisis here. Um, I think that there needs to be more uh, resources and budget mm. allocated to that the space to help people uh, because um, it's, it's, it's overwhelming for an individual's, yeah. um, you know, state of mind. It's, it's crazy how that works. Um, 
so of course the show is about purpose uh <laughs> what does purpose mean to you and how how has it show up in your life in your work in relationships so on yeah so purpose is interesting right like i i look at purpose and passion and they, they sim they're very similar right um but passion is really that emotional connection you know that 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 just drive i find and and where purpose is really the vision right mm -hmm. it's it's the vision it's the mission uh it doesn't necessarily tie into the action itself right mm -hmm. but it gives purpose or meaning you know it gives meaning to to the actions that we're doing you know it's sort of that because you know we we do we we all are searching for meaning aren't we and, and in some capacity or another um i know for myself and, and that's changed you know like my as my values have changed or shifted or matured in life uh you know starting to have kids many years ago you know uh, building different companies working with different types of people having different experiences you know like we're all just products of what happens in our lives <laughs> you know and you know you can feel like life happens to you or like you're an active participant in it in, in many capacities and i used to it took me a little while to shift and adopt to that you know realizing okay well maybe maybe these things that i want to do with my life you know maybe i can define those even clearer and what I mean by that is, you know, the Japanese call it ikigai, which is a philosophy which is very much tied into this purpose question you just had. And when you start looking into some of the work by Dan Butner and National Geographic, they, they research these five areas around the world called the blue zones. Mm. And the blue zones are really quite unique because they have the highest density population of people that live to be 100 or older, mm. centurions. Okay, and like high population density in these five places uh, around the world. And so what they did was they went and they basically immersed themselves in those cultures and observed mm -hmm. and interviewed and just watched what was going on here. What made this so special? These five places where people are not, and I, I don't mean like what we may believe, you know, in North America, predominantly, especially, well, especially North America or, or uh, Commonwealth countries. Right. <clears throat> when we think hundred years old or older, we're like, they must be in an old folks home somewhere, you know, or, or, or retirement, or they, they have nice ways of describing these homes now. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I should really figure out what, what those terms are, but you know, these assisted living homes, assisted living, right? And, and as soon as we think about that, it's like, okay, you're helping me live my life, you know, till when? Well, till I die, like, oh, okay, <laughs> doesn't, oh, interesting, you know, but, but our perception is, or belief systems are often tied that if you're of that age, it's just like, you're just waiting, right, you know, and what the Blue Zones did was shifted our ideas of what it means to get older, like, age truly is a number, it is a number, it's just a way of gauging how long we've been around, great, but it doesn't automatically influence quality of life, mm. Just because I get to 80 years old doesn't mean my quality of life has to be now of a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so they studied this and they found there was these nine common themes that were uniquely found, all of nine, within each of those five populations uh, densities. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool about that is it's like, oh, here's some data, here's proof, you know, and it's repeated. So you start talking about scientific method here. Yeah. It's, you can start to make some correlations here. You know, and and yeah, they don't overeat. They eat whole foods. They don't abuse alcohol. You know, they they might drink a little, but not abusive, not in excess. Right. They move their bodies every day naturally. What I mean by that is they walk, they dance, they garden, they go to the stores, but they don't drive. They walk. You know, like <laughs> you look at these simple lifestyle habits that they have, which are all accessible to every single one of us. Right. Every single one of us. These are not things you got to go pay for. Mm -hmm. Right. Obviously, well, yes, food. I mean, we live in a cultures that, that we do have to pay for food. So, yes. OK, there's a little bit there. But the other pieces are really lifestyle factors. It's just choosing to, to live a certain way and do things a certain way. And by doing it that way, there's some amazing benefits. So these people are living into their hundreds, man. They're independent. A lot of them are living on their own still. They're active in the community. They feel part of a community. They feel part of a tribe, but they have a strong connection to why they're alive. Mm -hmm. The Japanese, when they researched their population, and I think it was in Okinawa or 
forget the, the the actual city where they found that, but I'll have to look that up. But regardless, you know, this idea of icky guy, it, it's the reason you get up in the morning. Hmm. You know, so when I, you asked me, you know, what's my purpose or how's that driving? Well, it's what keeps me going, man. It's getting me excited about doing what I do. And it's why I get up in the morning. <laughs> And the interesting thing is, it is very much like sort of like Simon Sinek, he describes it as the why, you know, like, what's your why? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I loved how he talked about it. And, and he presents it in his original TEDx talk, right? Like he, he's like, you know, figuring out your why is an act of discovery, not an act of invention. Mm. Like, you don't just make up your purpose. Right. Like, I mean, maybe you can, you could try to articulate it, and you can, you know, you can wordsmith it. Mm -hmm. But you discover your purpose and it usually comes through living life, putting yourself in certain situations where you grow. Yeah. You outside that comfort zone for sure. <laughs> you know, because we don't know what we don't know. And we have to put ourselves into those situations if we're wanting to change and to grow and to be more connected to, to, to our own lives mm -hmm. as well as the people that we get to meet in them, you know? And uh, so that purpose piece, it, 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 you can't just invent it. Mm -hmm. It is something that you discover, but we often give meaning to the things that matter most. Right. And, and so I, I, it's one of those things I don't like to rush with people. Like, it's like, I encourage people figure out what is it? Like, how do you want to contribute? How, because people say, I don't you know, what's the meaning of life? And they ask me, like, I know the answer. I'm like, dude, I don't know what the answer to that is, but I know whatever meaning I give my life is the meaning of life. Like it's, it's a completely subjective question. And it's like, if I ask you, what's the meaning of life? Whatever answer you give me is absolutely correct. Right. For you. I think <laughs> yeah. Everyone has their own journey to walk yes. in terms of discovering yeah. what their purpose is. And their purpose is, is not the same as everyone else because of the values that they hold for themselves and the life experiences that they um, acquired throughout their entire lives. And so I think it's important to, of course, continue to discover what our purpose is and generate meaning, um, mm. you know, in that path. Um, and no answer is uh, incorrect because uh, people are, you know, every single one of us are, are worth it. We're worth it. Um, we are of value to our, our families, our friends, mm. our, the communities in which we're a part of, the society. And going back to your point about, um, am I worth it? That question, I mean, people have to believe in themselves. They have to yeah. believe that yeah. they are worth it. They, they're meant to do something good in this world, that there, there's an existence for them. And they were created uh, for, for a reason that... Um, you know, I, and I hope that all of these topics will contribute to um, the greater um, conversation of um, what is the meaning of life. And hopefully along the way, through trying to answer that, that, that big question, that we will find ways, avenues to eliminate anxiety, depression, um, yeah. you know, the mental health. Um, it's one of the reasons why I launched the podcast was that mm -hmm. my buddy was lacking a sense of purpose and he was depressed and, and he had anxiety. And so I wanted to produce content to hopefully help mm -hmm. folks like himself to um, find his own why, his own purpose. So that way he can get out of that mindset yeah. and um, tap into the light and, and then hopefully uh, once he's able to help himself, inspire others to do the same so that we can create a world that is full of light and positivity and inspiration and so um and quite frankly he's doing great and he listens nice. to his podcast and, <laughs> and positive feedback from others as well and so Love it. um you know i want to thank you uh for contributing your insight into this conversation and your insights and wisdom uh and being part of this community uh, of purpose-driven individuals um, trying to change the world to be in a better place. So I know we're about time. Um, where can people find you should they want to connect with you? Yeah, you know, I, I'm 
pretty active on social media. So you, you can find me at diamondwell.com, uh, which is my, my primary website. I've got, oh gosh, over 1700 articles now. I have been publishing wow. content there for 13 <laughs> years. So, and it's all lifestyle oriented content. So fitness, nutrition, mindset. Oh gosh, like habit formation. It's like, it is a bit of a rabbit hole, fair warning. <laughs> if you go there, you, you, you could get sucked in for a bit because there's a lot of good content there I'm, I'm very proud of the content and how it served my communities uh, but it's also a great way to start a conversation and if you want to have a conversation with me um, you know Facebook and Instagram are my two most active social channels uh, on the personal side and professionally LinkedIn uh, but I'm really easy to find because my name's pretty unique Dai yeah. D-A-I last name Manuel, M-A-N-U-E-L. Uh, you type that in, you'll find me. And because it's just my name on all the social platforms. It was so cool. It was so unencumbered. It made it really easy. To, every time a new platform, like even the clubhouse, it's like Diamond Well, oh, done. You know, like it was just like, it's super simple because I just got a unique name. And uh, which, you know, also creates challenges for people to find me sometimes. But, uh, and then other than that, I, I just want to say thank you, you know, for the opportunity to be here today. And uh you know, I, I've got a uh, upcoming TEDx talk and I talk about vulnerability in, in being, uh, I talk about vulnerability in men, but more specifically how vulnerability is a human quality, not just a man or a women's quality. It's, it's so much more than that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a human quality and, uh, and a skill that we can all develop more of. And uh, so I do share some stories there, especially my struggles with alcohol and narcotics uh, changed uh, my life a lot with that perspective about 11 years ago. And uh, finally, I have a platform where I can share that story. So uh, that is coming up. So uh, just be forewarned, you know, you go on any of my social platforms. I'm talking a lot about that right now because I'm really excited about it. So at the end of the month. Um, but uh, I think no, by the time this episode comes out, uh, I, I think you'll be able to see it online. You'll just be able to find it when you look me up. So um I, I, it's something I'm very passionate about right now. So men's work, uh, especially I have a lot of free groups for, for men to connect with each other. Um, we call it mentorship meetups. And it's just men coming together to authentically uh, support one another uh, without judgment, as well as, uh, well, you know what? It's just one of those conversations I, I love to help men have. So right. I just wanted to say that before we left, because I, I just know that based on what we've been talking about today, uh, these are resources I wish I had access to many, oh many years ago. Yeah. And, you know, as I've been just diving into this space, especially over the last decade, a lot of the personal and professional development I've been going through, I've just recognized where support's needed. And yeah. because I couldn't find it, I was like, I'll just start up some communities. And right. most of them are all free. Like, it, so this isn't a money thing. This is a purpose thing for me. Okay. And wow. I just want people to be clear on that. And uh, so there's no hidden agenda here. It's just an open invitation. And uh, so that for any men that are out there and sorry, ladies, I, I, my wife does women's version. So uh, you can always reach out if you want that yes. connection to her, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm only working with the guys on the mentorship side, but uh, when it comes to healthy living and, and getting the most out of life, uh, I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone. That's powerful. Wow. Well, dude, you're doing such amazing work. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. your existence, your work and your impact. Uh, you're truly valuable to uh, the people uh, you've touched, the, the people that you've uh, touched the lives. And I want to thank you for um, being on this purpose to, to create a better world for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for putting this together. You know, like, Creating this kind of content, oh man, <laughs> you're leading a conversation that I think a lot of us, we feel that we want to have more of, you know what I mean? And it's just, sometimes we're just not sure how to get started and man, you are providing plenty of ways to get started, but also continue. And uh, so thanks yeah. for allowing me to be a part of the conversation with you. And I, I feel like we'll be having another one pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Well, Sweet. hey, thanks a lot and uh, take care. Thanks, Carl.